Good morning and welcome to our Sunday service once again. If you're here for the first time, you're very welcome. If you're a regular and you've been looking in over the weeks, then welcome back. Today we are continuing our series on the Sermon on the Mount. And today's subject is entitled The Kingdom of Integrity. But first we're going to share a hymn together. I think you'll agree that this week has been quite a difficult one. We've had additional lockdown, an increase in the number of cases locally, and once again things are looking very uncertain. I was very encouraged yesterday by the hymn that Alwyn Richards put up on Castleton's Singspiration, and we're going to start with that hymn. Now I don't know if you watch Castleton's Singspiration at all, but it is worth following. If you've never viewed it, you can find it on Facebook, just type in Castleton Singspiration and you'll find it. And I know you'll be blessed by it. Anyway, back to the hymn. Sometimes when we go through a difficult week, as many as of us have over the past week, we begin wondering where will it all end? And is God really there when I need him? Well, this hymn reminds us that we have a God who still has a plan for us and who is there even in the darkest valley. He's there to help, to comfort and to strengthen. Our opening hymn this morning is entitled Sovereign Over Us and it's sung by Michael W. Smith. Thank you. There is strength within the sorrow There is beauty in our tears And you meet us in our mourning With a love that casts out fear You are working in are waiting you're sanctifying us when beyond our understanding you're teaching us to trust your plans are still to prosper you have not forgotten us You're with us in the fire and the flood You're faithful forever Perfect in love You are sovereign over us You are wisdom Understand your ways, reigning high above the heavens, reaching down in endless grace. You're the lifter of the lowly. Surround and you uphold me, and your promises are my delight. Your plans are still to prosper.
Well, thank you, Alwyn, for putting that hymn up for us this week. It was a real blessing to me, and I hope you all enjoyed it as much as I did the first time. That It's a new hymn to me. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that you are there for us. And thank you, Lord, that you have a purpose and a plan for each one of us. But, Lord, we would just remind ourselves that for us to enjoy that blessing, that nearness, that guidance and that comfort, we have to own your sovereignty. We have to make you our Lord. And so, Father, as we come together this morning, we pray that we might, might come with hearts that are yielded to your purposes and surrendered to your will. Lord, as we look once again this morning at the words of the Lord Jesus, as he could speak to his followers on that hillside near Jerusalem, that we too might take his words to heart and that we might put them into practice. Thank you, Lord, that we are reminded this morning that we need to be people of integrity, people who can be trusted. And Lord, as we consider the words of the Lord Jesus, we pray that your Holy Spirit will challenge our hearts that you will draw near to us and show us the sort of people that we should be through him living in us. We thank you, Lord, for each one who is viewing in this morning. We pray your blessing upon each one and upon each home. We pray that you would quieten us and give us peace as we look at all the uncertainty around us. We do pray too, Father, for the situation that exists not just throughout the world but locally as well and father when it comes local we feel it more acutely and we do pray for all those who are going through the difficulty of coping with isolation of coping with the virus itself of facing all the uncertainty that abounds all around us lord we pray that you would lead us through this crisis and that you would point the way forward help us lord to trust you Help us to take the words of our opening hymn and apply them to ourselves. Above all, help us to give you first place in all that we are. Thank you for this time that we can spend together. Bless us now, we pray, as we share your word and as we celebrate your, your sovereignty, as we commit this service to you now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Now we're going to have another hymn together. This time it's not a new hymn to me, it's one that I heard almost 30 years ago. Uh, first time I heard it was sung by Ray Bevan from Newport. This time it's sung by Hill Songs. It's the hymn, The Power of Your Love. And then after the hymn, Gwyneth is going to give us our reading for today.
The reading today follows on from last week and is Matthew chapter 5 verses 33 to 37. Again, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, Do not break your oath, but fulfil to the Lord the oaths you have made. But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. All you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. Thank you. Our reading today reminds us that the Lord Jesus calls us to a life of integrity. But of course that in integrity can only be attained by a life that is surrendered to him. One that he controls entirely. And so our next hymn which we're going to share before we think further upon those words is the one I will offer up my life in spirit and truth. Some years back, Joyce Kilmer wrote this poem. I think that I shall never see a poem lovely as a tree, a tree whose hungry mouth is pressed against the earth's sweet flowing breast. 
a tree that looks at God all day and lifts her leafy arms to pray, a tree that may in summer wear a nest of robins in her hair, upon whose bosom snow has lain, who intimately lives with rain. Poems are made by fools like me, but only God can make a tree. Joyce Kilmer employs a certain amount of poetic license in that poem, and maybe you're wondering at this point, what on earth has this got to do with the Sermon on the Mount? But what Joyce Kilmer does there is capture something of the grandeur of a tree. Now, I always enjoy a good walk, and I don't really mind where I walk. Particularly enjoy walking along water, whether it's the sea or a river or a lake. But I also enjoy walking through woodland. And just last week I was walking with Gwyneth along the old railway track quite near to where I live. And as we were walking I couldn't help but noticing the amazing variety of the trees that surrounded me. And some of them are just turning into their autumn shades now, just beginning to. And they really are beautiful. Trees are quite amazing. I always remember the time we visited Western Burt Arboretum and there they've got a huge variety of trees and some of those trees are really quite massive. But you know the amazing thing about the tree and this is really what I'm getting to eventually is that we only see half of them. Particularly deciduous hardwood trees there is as much below the ground as there is above. And it's amazing to think how deep those roots go down into the ground. And they form an, a, a vital function for that tree. They anchor it into the ground so that those huge trees which weigh tons are held upright in the strongest wind. It supplies with nourishment and water and you know, this tree is a little bit like us. There's more of us which are hidden than which is seen. And just as the tree roots supply the nourishment to the tree, so also our inner person supplies to us the sort of people that we are. It determines what we are like. Of course, as we look at each other, we only see the outside. But when God looks at us, he sees what's inside. Now, we thought a little bit about this last week when we uh, thought about Samuel as he went to select the first, the, sorry, the next king of Israel. Saul was on the throne and he went to find the next king at the house of Jesse. And there God gave him that powerful message that man looks on the outside, God looks on the heart. And you know, that's exactly the picture that Jesus is bringing before us here in Matthew chapter 5 as we move on to the next part. We're going to divide uh, the next section, which is verses 21 to 37, into two parts. We've read the second part, but I'm going to refer very, very briefly to the first part because it is relevant. We're going to put a title over the whole lot, and the title is The Root of Who We Are, and it brings before us the idea of the kingdom of integrity. In the first part, we're going to look at the things inside us which are bad. And in the second part, we're going to look at the things which should be inside us, which are good. And I hope, that as we look at the two together, we'll see that the mirror complement each other. The first part is found in chapter 5 verses 21 to 32 and in this section Jesus starts referring back to the law he's been talking about the righteousness of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law the scribes and now he's amplifying it by going to familiar ground for them he is talking about the law and he introduces it with the words you have heard that it was said he then refers to two of the Ten Commandments in the section that we're looking at now and they are probably two of what we might call the most serious sin. Now, I know in God's eyes, all sin is serious. But in the society in which we live, perhaps these two are the two that people would frown upon more. And they are murder and adultery. Now, these two commandments are so obviously external. 
And yet as Jesus brings them before us, he takes them right back to what's inside. He takes us to what we are in here. Jesus then went on to say, after he had said, you have heard that it has been said, he then adds to it, but I say to you, and in doing so, he brings before us the true nature of these sins. And the true nature is the internal motivation. Let's deal with each one in turn. Firstly, Jesus speaks of murder. And he says, but I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. The Apostle John puts it much the same way in 1 John 3.15. He says, anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer. Here Jesus takes the external act of murder and takes it right back to the intention that is formed in seed form in a person's heart. Then he speaks of adultery by saying, you have heard it said you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her. Now, some might ask the question, is Jesus taking this too far? Is Jesus stretching this to the extreme? Someone might protest, what harm do my thoughts play? If I'm not doing it, it doesn't hurt anyone. If I'm just looking lustfully at somebody, does that affect anybody in any way? If I feel malice towards somebody, as long as I keep it in here, does it matter? Sadly, it does. You see, the truth is that very often the deed comes from the thought. And in that sense, they're inseparable. Inseparable. You, you know, to see the full implication of this, we only need to go to the life of King David. We thought very briefly last week of how um, Samuel went to Jesse's house and there finally he met David and God described David as a man after my own heart. And David was indeed one of the greatest, if not the greatest king that Israel saw. He was a man who feared God and served him with total devotion. And yet, there was one time in David's life when he fell miserably. He made a number of mistakes, but possibly this one was the greatest. And I'm sure you know where I'm going at the moment. I'm going to his encounter with Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. We read in uh, 1 Samuel, sorry, 2 Samuel, that the army had gone out to fight and David had remained in his palace in Jerusalem. He should have been with the army, but he wasn't. And one evening he was walking on the roof of his palace and there he looked and saw a woman. And that look should have been all that there was, but that look led to a question, who is she? It led to an invitation. She was brought into the palace and it led to adultery as they slept together. But it didn't stop there. For when David found out that Bathsheba was pregnant, he knew he had to do something about it. His first attempt was to try to shift his sin onto Uriah's shoulders by bringing him back from the battle and sending him home, hoping he'd sleep with his wife and they would think that the baby was Uriah's. But it didn't work. So David got him drunk and that didn't work either. Finally, David took his pen and resorted to murder by commanding Joab to put Uriah in the thick of the battle so he would be killed. You know, it's interesting. It's also incredibly sad that the two things that Jesus mentions here in Matthew 5 are the two things that were David's foot downfall. You know, the same is true of us. Sadly, if we allow our thoughts to run unchecked, those thoughts can lead us into all sorts of trouble. Like the tree with its roots, thoughts can be as big or bigger than what is seen on the outside. The word 
of God in Jeremiah 17 tells us the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure who can understand it now at this point we need to go back to what we spoke about last week for like the Pharisees any righteousness that we have of ourselves is always flawed the word of God describes our righteousnesses as filthy rags in his eyes of course, as we said last week, this is speaking about our righteousness. And as Jesus pointed at the Pharisees and told his listeners, your righteousness must exceed theirs. He was talking about human ability and human goodness. That's not the righteousness that God is looking for in us. The righteousness that he is looking for is the one that he himself provides. It's not ours, but Christ's. And when we trust him as saviour and receive him as Lord and master, then he imparts upon us his righteousness so that we appear before God blameless and pure. When this happens, God sends his Holy Spirit to dwell within us, to empower us to live lives that are pleasing to him and to witness to others. Of course, we still make mistakes. There is still the old nature in there, battling with the new nature. And Paul spoke about this in length, at length in the book of Romans. But that new nature is there, the righteousness of God in Christ. Now this brings us on to our second part of the message for today, where Jesus spoke about making vows. Here we're looking at what we might call the good that the Lord Jesus places within us what he expects us to be. It was the practice among Jewish people to make vows, to make promises. And these were usually bound by something that they held to be sacred. It might be the temple, it might be the altar, it might be heaven, it might be a number of things. But Jesus says, don't do it. Don't vow by anything sacred. When you say yes, you should mean yes. That should be enough. When you say no, it should mean no. People should be able to, inter to trust the word that you give. What Jesus is speaking about here is our integrity. When we are given the righteousness of God in Christ, we need to live lives that are honest and transparent. Now, as I said before, that doesn't mean we won't make mistakes. Like David, we can get it badly wrong. But we need, as witnesses to Christ and as his re representatives on earth, to reflect the goodness, his goodness, to those around. Of course, human nature will always look for a way out of trouble, even if it means telling lies. Even if it means going outside what we're talking about here. I heard this little story and it quite amused me. Four high school boys probably in the upper six were late for class one morning and as they entered the classroom and told their teacher that they were detained due to a flat tire the teacher smiled and told them it was too bad because they were late and because uh, because they were late they'd missed a test but she was willing to let them make it up and uh, she gave each of them a piece of paper and a pencil and sent the four of them to the four corners of the room with their backs towards each other. She said, if you can answer one question, you will pass the test. And she gave them the question, which tyre was flat? Hmm. There's another verse in the Bible that says, be sure your sin will find you out. We need to have integrity. Jesus said all you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. James says something very similar in James 5 verse 12. He says above all my brothers and sisters do not swear not by heaven or by earth or by anything else. All you need to say is a simple yes or no. Otherwise you will be condemned. When we give, our, give people our word, is that enough for them? We live in a world of small print 
and get-out clauses in contracts. People are looking for the way out to shirk their responsibility and to find a way out of difficulty. We need to be people who say what we mean and are willing to stand by that. We need to have integrity in our words. We also need to have integrity in our actions. Firstly, in our actions towards other people. There's a lovely story about the great man Abraham Lincoln. He was called Honest Abe. Before he became president, at the age of 24, Lincoln served as postmaster in New Salem, Illinois. And for this, he was, he was paid the princely sum of $55.70 a year. Even then, 24 years before he entered the White House, this man was earning the reputation and the character that later earned him the title Honest Abe. The post office where he worked was closed in 1836. But it was many years later that an agent arrived from Washington to settle accounts with the ex-postmaster Abraham Lincoln. At that time Lincoln had become a lawyer, not doing very well, struggling financially and, and as the agent informed him as he went through the books of the, the post station as it was, he said there was an outstanding sum of $17 due to the government. Lincoln crossed the room, opened an old trunk and took out a, a yellow cloth bound with a string. Untying it, he spread out the cloth and there on the cloth were $17. He'd been holding that payment which was due untouched all those years. He later said, I never use any man's money but my own. You know, in this society where we uh, live in a credit society where people will spend today and worry tomorrow. It's admirable to see the honesty of this man. People will judge our God by the way we act towards them and towards others. We must be people of integrity when we deal with people, all people. Jesus should affect how we conduct ourselves. And when we say we're going to do something, it should be good as done. But not only should we have integrity in our actions towards other people, but we should have integrity in our actions towards God. The Lord Jesus went on to say, Again you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, Do not break your oath, but fulfil to the Lord the oaths you have made. Now, it was a common thing for Jewish people to make vows and oaths before God, to promise to do things, to promise to offer a sacrifice. We have an example of someone who didn't do that. In Acts chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira lied to God. And that's why they died. They volunteered to give the proceeds of their land to God, but then they withheld part of it. When we tell God that we're going to commit our lives to him, we must keep that promise. When we say that we love God, then we will keep his commandments. There is a verse back in the uh, book of Psalms, Psalm 139. It says, search me, O Lord, and know my heart. As God looks upon us, does he see people that he can trust? He will only give us responsibilities in his work if we're trustworthy. In closing, may I use one of the quotes of another American president, uh, US President Harry Truman, who speaking of the importance of a good name he could say these words, fame is a vapour, popularity an accident, riches take wings, those who cheer today 
may curse tomorrow. Only one thing lasts, character. May God bless you and may God encourage you to surrender all to him and trust him to make you and I the people he wants us to be. Of course, coming back to where we started, what's on the outside must be what's on the inside. Our hearts have to be right before God and we must allow him to take our hearts and make them new to make them his. David, when he failed, and we remember that failure this morning, it caused him to write a beautiful psalm, Psalm 51. And um, in that psalm he could cry out to God not only for forgiveness but for renewal. He wanted his name to be great again, that people would look upon him and see God's power. And our closing, our closing hymn for today is a prayer like that of David. It says, cleanse my heart, O God, make it ever new. Thank you. thank you for joining us today I hope you've been blessed I hope you've been challenged and I hope as you face another week it will be with the encouragement of knowing the nearness of the Lord Jesus with you day by day let's close our time together with the blessing of Moses the Lord bless you and keep you the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Thank you for joining us. May the Lord bless you.